This conference will now be recorded. Thank you and welcome to all of our participants tonight at our online public information center meeting for the JFK Boulevard study from Pavonia to St. Paul's. I'm going to go ahead and read the memo that was sent out for anyone who did not receive it. Hudson County in cooperation with the North Jersey Transportation Planning Authority and the New Jersey Department of Transportation is hosting tonight's second online public information center meeting to share information about the local concept development study of JFK Boulevard from Pavonia Avenue to St. Paul's Avenue in Jersey City. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to solicit input and comment on the conceptual alternatives and preliminary preferred alternative or PPA developed for the roadway improvements. This meeting is being conducted in conformance with federal and state regulations, and the public has been invited and encouraged to comment on this study. Tonight's meeting is open to all members of the public. Written comments will be accepted via the Contact Us page on the project website through March 18th. You may also mail them or email them to myself or to Jose Sierra from Hudson County. All of that information will be available at the end of the presentation. So at this point, I do believe we are ready to get started. I'm gonna hand things over to Jose for some opening remarks and we'll go from there. So thank you again, everyone. Oh, Jose's muted. Uh, Julia? Sorry. Oh, oh, there you are. Okay, Jose. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jose Sierra. I'm the project manager for, for this project, which is Kennedy Boulevard from Babonia Avenue to St. Paul's Avenue. This is for local concept development plan, and it's a project uh, through NJTPA. Um, the limits of the project are from uh, Pavonia Avenue to St. Paul's Avenue in the city of Jersey City. And uh, NJTPA has hired a consultant, GPI. And if you could go to the next slide, um, please. And right now I'm going to go over the project team. Can you go to the next slide, please? Right, and um, the project team is composed of uh, Tom Malabasi, he's the county engineer. Myself, I'm the project manager, and I'm the traffic engineer for the county. Sasha Frimfrom, she's the director of local programs from NJTPA. Patricia Newton, she's the project manager for this project. Representatives from NJDOT, Pamela Garrett, Paul Miranda, Nabil Ju, GPI Bernie Borchers, he's the project manager, Christopher Mara, Deputy Project Manager, Julia Stefano, she's the traffic engineer and the technical assistance, and Nicole, she's the community involvement facilitator. At this time, I'm gonna turn the meeting right now to Julia. She's gonna be presenting us uh, the following slides. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jose. I'm just gonna go back a slide quickly um, and go over the agenda for this meeting. Um, so first, we're, we just presented the project team. We're gonna go over the NJDOT and NJTPA project delivery process, um, a brief um, introduction to the project location and existing conditions, the purpose and needs statement developed from prior survey results to the public and stakeholders, the alternatives, um, the operational analysis, the recommended alternative, and then next steps before we open it up to questions. And again, you can enter your questions or comments in the chat box throughout the presentation, and then we will get to them at the end. So the project delivery process consists of four distinct phases. The first phase is local concept development, which is what we're in right now. Um, and this is where we collect all the data on the existing conditions. We analyze it. We develop the project's purpose and need. Um, we develop alternatives and we evaluate their impacts. And ultimately we select a preliminary preferred alternative. This is then followed by local preliminary engineering, where the preliminary preferred alternative, which I will also uh, refer to as PPA throughout this presentation, um, is advanced to the point necessary to obtain approval of any 
required design exceptions, and the environmental document. The final phase in design is final design, where all the necessary permits are obtained, any right away that's needed is required, um, and the construction documents are finalized. After final design, the project advances to construction. Like Jose said, the project limits extend along JFK Boulevard between Pavonia Avenue and oh, slightly north of St. Paul's Avenue. Um, as you are all familiar, this is the area um, in the vicinity of Journal Square. It's high density, mixed use, commercial and residential with significant ongoing and planned development um, throughout really Jersey City as a whole, but especially through the project limits. So just to go over some of the crash data and analysis that we conducted during concept development, we reviewed a three-year period from 2016 through 2018 for vehicles and 2014 through 2018 for pedestrian and bicyclist crashes. There were 256 vehicular crashes during this time period and 18 pedestrian and or bicyclist crashes during this time period. Um, the calculated crash rate along this section um, is 30.67 crashes per million vehicle miles traveled. Um, some of the overrepresentations, um, which are uh, seen in the crash data, um, are same direction sideswipe. And um, of most concern is the pedestrian and bicyclists and left turn crashes because those are typically higher severity. As you can see in the top right, um, that's a collision diagram that we prepared, just a sample. Um, each of the colors represents a different year and each of the circles represents an individual crash. In the bottom right um, is a graph showing where crashes occurred. Um, and as you can see, most crashes occur at signalized intersections. We also looked at traffic data and did some analysis on that. Um, the traffic data was all collected in 2019, so pre-pandemic volumes. Um, the ADT along this section of JFK Boulevard is about uh, 21,000 vehicles per day, which is on the high side for Hudson County. Um, the majority of vehicles travel through the corridor, meaning that trips originate and end outside the project limits. Looking at the pedestrian volumes, which are provided in the graph and the diagram, um, our typical weekday uh, totals during three peak hours, the morning, the midday, and the PM. And as you can see, the area around Pavonia Avenue has the highest amount. Um, there's a little bit of a drop at Van Ripen. And when you get to Cottage and Newark Avenues, um, you're averaging about 2,400 pedestrians. The bar chart um, shows these numbers again, and it also shows the corresponding bicyclist volumes that we collected at the same time. Um, so as shown in this bar chart, there are significantly more pedestrians than bicyclists in the area based on this data. <clears throat> so based on all the input we received from um, this, we did a survey uh, maybe a year or two ago at this point, um, and looking at all the data, we developed the purpose and need statement. So the purpose of this project is to enhance safety and mobility along with reducing congestion along JFK Boulevard between Pavonia Avenue and St. Paul's Avenue. The need is driven primarily by the existing crash rate and significant pedestrian volumes, and the goals and objectives are from stakeholder input. Um, and just to note, it's important for this project to move forward into design and the following information will help get us there. Some of the constraints that we've had to deal with for this project um, include um, the 60 foot pavement width, um, the uh, high volume of New Jersey transit buses. They are about 10 feet, six inches wide, including the mirrors. 
So 11 foot lanes are important to get commuters to and from Journal Square. We have a high number of pedestrians with that goes above uh, 3,000 pedestrians um, in three peak hours, specifically at Pavonia Avenue as you get closer to Journal Square. Um, the typical minimum sidewalk width of six feet is not sufficient for these volumes. Some of the other issues we um, encountered are significant underground utilities and adjacent buildings that have basements underneath the sidewalk. And this limits locations where items like poles and barriers um, can be installed. Um, surrounding roadways are already at or near capacity and many of the parallel routes that are um, available are residential streets. So there's really no place else for uh, traffic to divert to. Um, and then of course, re the redevelopment can mean more generators, volume, uh, require more underground utilities, um, and everything on this slide is vying for the same amount of space. Um, so what this generally means is um, we cannot reduce the number of lanes to less than two in each direction. Um, and obviously there would be limited space to widen, um, which we wouldn't want to do anyway. Um, <clears throat> what, what you'll see as we move forward is um, that we are adjusting signal timings for pedestrians. So we're not prioritizing motorists. Um, and we need to be mindful of improving safety within the project limits while not pushing the problem elsewhere. So now I'm gonna talk about some of the safety elements that we considered during concept development, um, specifically what we can use at intersections, which accounted for 42 and 83% of vehicular and pedestrian crashes respectively. At signalized intersections, we can implement countermeasures such as backplates with retro reflective borders, update the yellow change intervals, or add um, lead pedestrian intervals, also called LPIs, and enhance the lighting, especially during for nighttime conditions. <clears throat> Excuse me. These four that are have the asterisks are FH1, FHWA's proven safety countermeasures and have associated crash reductions based on data-driven approach. For example, yellow change interval updates can reduce all crashes, including red light running. Curb extensions are also beneficial because they shorten the pedestrian crossing distance and improve visibility of the pedestrian to vehicles and for the pedestrian to see traffic. There are also safety elements that can address pedestrian and bicyclist crashes, both at intersections and along roadways. We can implement countermeasures such as additional walkways or wider walkways, enhanced crosswalks, pedestrian refuge islands. Um, we can look at bike lanes, and those top four are also FHWA proven safety countermeasures, again, associated with crash reductions based on data-driven research. Um, I will note that the bike lane crash reduction is actually new for this year. It just, just came out in 2021. And there's only a few studies conducted on uh, road segments, and there's limited data on intersections at this, at this time. Another countermeasure is all pedestrian phase where all vehicles are stopped and pedestrians have the right of way, which removes all conflicts with vehicles. Of course, the catch is pedestrians must be willing to wait for their exclusive phase. So now I'm gonna go through the alternatives that we developed during concept development. Um, what you see here is a rendering um, of the first alternative, which is um, pedestrian improvements or curb extensions, geometric and safety improvements, um, and this picture is JFK Boulevard by the Stanley Theater, which is off to the right. Um, based on some stakeholder input that we received, we investigated a signalized pedestrian crossing at Van Ripen Avenue, 
um, that's all the way in the background um, pointing to it with one of the icons. There are curb extensions proposed at Pavonia, Newark, and Van Winkle Avenues. Um, pedestrian refuge islands at Pavonia Avenue and Cottage Street. Widened sidewalk at Newark and St. Paul's Avenue. And a additional crosswalk um, on the north approach at St. Paul's Avenue. Um, again, we have 11 foot travel lanes to accommodate New Jersey transit buses. Um, what you may also notice is that we removed several lanes um, in this in this picture and throughout the corridor. So the the fourth southbound and third northbound lane in the vicinity of Pavonia Avenue are gone. The third southbound lane south of Newark will also be removed. Uh, the channelized right turn that currently exists at Newark Avenue will be changed to just a regular right turn. And the dedicated right turn lane at St. Paul's Avenue going southbound um, is removed. And this allows us to reduce the pedestrian crossing distances and conflict points at intersections. Um, as shown, the median will be landscaped with a variety of plants, which will be determined in design. Um, this was also based on some stakeholder input. We also investigated uh, raised planters, but we had concerned about having concerns about having unprotected fixed objects in the center um, island close to the traveled way. So this option um, doesn't have planters, but it's also uh, softer and more open to light and air. So this alternative addresses the immediate safety concerns for pedestrians and at intersection crashes. And it also does not preclude future accommodations for other transportation modes. Moving on to alternative number two, this proposes a five foot bike lane on each side of uh, JFK Boulevard starting at Pavonia Avenue. There will be a crossover with a two stage bike box in the southbound dir direction at Pavonia Avenue um, to meet it, what would be um, a two way bike lane. Um, as you can see, this is um, not a protected bike lane, which is uh, not favorable. We have a buffer that um, we can provide at Pavonia Avenue, but as you go further north, the roadway narrows and we would not be able to provide um, a buffer and there's no buffer in the southbound direction. Um, so it's not obviously ideal for bicyclists. Again, um, the third northbound lane and fourth southbound lane of Pavonia Avenue um, is removed. The third southbound lane of Newark Avenue from Newark Avenue to Pavonia is removed. The channelized right turn at Newark Avenue is changed to a um, conventional right turn lane. And the right turn lane at St. Paul's Avenue is also removed. This alternative also addresses the immediate safety concerns for pedestrians and at intersection crashes. Um, while beginning to um, look at one of the goals to improve bicycle access, but without protect protection, excuse me, um, it was not preferred by stakeholders. Alternative number three was a two-way protected bike lane along the northbound direction of JFK Boulevard. Um, again, and with all the alternatives, actually, um, there will be a signalized pedestrian crossing at Van Ripen. Again, based on stakeholder input, um, we'll have the same curb or similar curb extensions and pedestrian refuge islands, the removal of travel lanes um, along JFK Boulevard, um, but maintaining two 11 foot lanes in each direction. Um, just something to note, while we were able to achieve some barrier separation for the bicycle lane, we could not achieve it along the entire lane due to existing driveways, utilities, and fire hydrants, um, which need to be accessible. So where we couldn't provide a full barrier, we provided a curved island with delineators, and if neither of those were feasible, in-pavement delineators would be proposed. So this alternative also addresses the immediate safety concerns for pedestrians and at intersection crashes, 
while providing one of the goals to improve bicyclist access. The fourth alternative um, is similar, but just provides a northbound only protected bike lane. It's buffered, um, it's protected with barrier where we could protect it. Otherwise, there is the raised curb with delineators. And if neither of those were, were possible, then um, just flexible delineators would go in the pavement. Again, signalized pedestrian crossing at Van Ripen, curb extensions, pedestrian refuge islands, and removal of um, travel lanes. 11 foot lanes for New Jersey transit buses again. Um, and um, this also addresses the immediate safety concerns for pedestrians and at intersection crashes um, while providing one of the goals to improve bicyclist access. So now you may be wondering why did we develop an alternative that just has a northbound protected bike lane? Well, the intent was to have a southbound counterpart on a parallel route based on Jersey City Master Bike Plan with a connection using St. Paul's Avenue. Um, due to ongoing discussions in the city, we could not reach a consensus on um, a bike lane option. And just to note, an alternative without a bike lane would not preclude future installation. Um, but because this project has been going on for um, almost two years now, and in the interest of pedestrian safety, um, we are looking to advance the project into the next phase. Um, this is an operational analysis of each of the alternatives. Um, the volumes were projected to a design year of 2045. We use population and employment data from NJTPA and any available um, redevelopment uh, volumes. So as you can see, the, um, excuse me, the no build off to the left, um, and then each of the alternatives, the change with the um, updated yellow change intervals and pedestrian crossing times and removal of the vehicular travel and turn lanes um, does worsen the vehicular level of service throughout the corridor. Um, for those that aren't familiar, um, the level of service is given a letter grade, kind of like in school. So A is a, is a good grade and F is a bad grade. Um, and this is based on the amount of delay. So you, as you can see, the Fs are much higher. They're in the 100s, 200 seconds um, versus the Bs, which are about 10 seconds. Um, <clears throat> Just to note, we have not gotten an opportunity to analyze the signal at Van Ripen Avenue, but since it's primarily for pedestrians, uh, we don't foresee it um, being a degrading level of service at that location. Um, Pavonia and Newark Avenues also feature all pedestrian phases. So like I said, um, pedestrians get their own phase and all vehicles are stopped. So our recommended preliminary preferred alternative, PPA, um, is alternative one, which proposes the curb extensions, um, the geometric and safety improvements, uh, and no bike lanes. Again, this addresses the immediate safety concerns, um, but does not meet some of the goals of, uh, that were <clears throat> presented by the stakeholders. We did investigate the feasibility of bike lanes. As you saw, we had three alternatives with bike lanes. Um, and while the team is not opposed to bike lanes, uh, we agreed that they may not be appropriate along this section of JFK Boulevard. The proposed improvements of the PPA will significantly improve safety for pedestrians, which represents the most vulnerable and overwhelming majority of non-motorized road users. And again, the PPA does not preclude adding bike lanes at a future date. So now that you've seen the renderings, I will just go over 
the plan view of the entire project corridor. Um, as you can see, there are, are curb extensions and a wider median at Livonia and Van Ripen. Van Ripen will be a signalized pedestrian crossing. A median refuge island is provided at Cottage Street. And the median between Pavonia and Cottage Street will be landscaped. And again, any of the plant details will be um, determined in design. Moving north to Newark and Van Winkle Avenues, the sidewalk is widened by changing the existing northbound channelized right turn to a standard turn lane. Curb extensions are provided along the southbound direction as well. The third outside southbound lane is removed with the section between Newark and Van Winkle becoming a right turn only lane. Continuing north to St. Paul's Avenue, the sidewalk on the southbound side is widened by removing the right turn lane and a pedestrian crossing is also proposed on the north approach. So that's it for the existing conditions and the alternatives. I'm going to go over the next steps really quickly. Um, so we gather all our public input after having today's public information center. Again, you have until March 18th to provide comments. After that, um, we will select a preliminary preferred alternative. Um, we will get uh, resolutions of support and present the project to an interagency review committee. And that will determine whether the project can advance to design. And once that's all done, local concept development will be wrapped up and the project can move into preliminary engineering. So thank you for sitting and listening to me drone on. Um, like Nicole said, these are the ways you can contact us um, to be official comments, get them on the record. You can um, email um, or call Jose Sierra. You can use the preferred method, which is the contact form on the website, or you can send an email or regular mail to Nicole at Stokes. Again, um, we will be accepting comments through March 18th. And with that, um, that concludes the presentation. So I can turn it back over to Nicole, who can um, start going through the chat box. Thank you so much, Julia, for that great presentation. And thank you to everybody who has joined in this meeting. We have a very large number of participants tonight and holy moly, there are so many comments and questions in the chat box. So I did ask everyone to please bear with me as I try to sort through them all um, due to the size of the meeting. And we, have, we do have several callers who we do need to give an opportunity to ask their questions. So I ask that hopefully you all uh, can just bear with me. Please try to limit your questions to the chat box so that I can easily get to them, hopefully as soon as possible. I'll ask our project team to be as succinct with your responses as possible so that we can get to all of them because we do need to stick to our time meeting tonight. The meeting will be ending officially at 7 p.m. So uh, again, uh, one last time before we get into the Q&A, all of the comments that you're putting into the chat box, although I do see them, they are not considered official comments. They must be sent via email. My email address is on the screen. My uh, Jose's email is on the screen, his phone number. And of course, the preferred method, the best method is using the contact form on the website. Again, that's jfkblvdproject.com dot com and you can just click contact form and that is the best way to reach us okay so i am going to go through all of these messages and uh hopefully we will get to everybody and i'll give a break in the middle for us to get to some of the callers who are on as well okay so let's go back to the beginning one of the questions that first came up was regarding the crash data and a couple of people asked the question, is it possible to gather more recent crash data? We're missing three years of recent data and also can the original crash data be made available to the public? 
I will answer the first part of the question. Um, so as everybody knows, we kind of went through this little COVID pandemic thing. Um, so more recent crash records are not all available yet, even from 2020. So the most recent that we could go to would be 2019. Um, that said, even if we did do 2020 and 2021, um, we would have to take into consideration the fact that um, traffic pedestrians were not as they were typically. Um, so we may find some skewed results. So right now we're only going up to 2019 with crash data. Um, for the second question, I do not believe that the diagrams will be made available, um, but I will open that up to the team in case I'm wrong. Okay, so we're... Nobody wants to speak. I guess I'm not wrong. Uh, I think, again, I don't, I don't if, think there's if, a problem Tom, putting them you. up on the website when we when we post the presentation, um, certainly okay. can do that. Yeah. Sure. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tom. Okay. On on slide twelve, Julia, you mentioned segments only by reducing lane and shoulder. Can you explain what that means? Um, let me go back to slide 12 because I don't need to see what it was first. Can you repeat the question again, please? Sure. What does segments only by reducing lane slash shoulder mean? Um, so for this slide, I think the only thing I talked about segments for was for the bicycle lanes, because that is a new proven safety countermeasure. The data that has been studied thus far is only looking at um, segments of bike lanes. So they're not look, they haven't looked yet at the interaction um, at the intersections where everybody kind of comes together and is jockeying for position. Okay, great. And again, for all the people calling, uh, putting their questions into the chat box, I did ask that if you can possibly reference whatever slide you'd like to see or, you know, ask a question regarding a specific slide, we will certainly do our best to accommodate that. So, okay, back to the questions. How will the all pedestrian crossing phase work? I like the idea of all pedestrian crossing phase, but I don't want it to cause pedestrians to wait through both directions, vehicle light cycles before getting a chance to cross in either direction. Um, okay, so that's pretty much exactly what it is. Um, so let's say JFK has a green and somebody's on the side street and somebody hits the push button, um, it would go to the side street and then all the vehicles would stop. Everybody would get a red ball and then the pedestrians would get the, um, the walking man for whatever number of seconds that we determine is uh, appropriate. And then they will get the don't walk hand with the countdown. Um, and then they will get the solid hand, which means don't walk. Um, and then that cycle would repeat over and over again. So yes, you would have to wait um, for the, the vehicles to be given the all red. Now, there are various ways that that can be programmed. Um, if we just don't necessarily look at that um, in great detail in concept development, that's something that would be hashed out in design on, on what the timings would actually be. But um, I think they answered their own question. Okay, great. Uh, again, I'm not sure what slide this is referring to. I'm sorry, uh, but I did ask everyone to try to put their 
references in there when they ask questions in the chat box. But the question is, can we eliminate all right on red for cars? Um, yes, we can do no turn on reds. Yes. Okay. Okay, next question. If you put in the bike lanes near the sidewalk and it is near a bus stop, how is the bus supposed to get over to the edge of the sidewalk to pick up disabled wheelchair passengers? That is a very good question. Um, from what I understand, um, New Jersey Transit's policy is they will not traverse over a bike lane. Um, so we would have to come up with some other accommodations at the bus stops to make sure that um, somebody, say, in a wheelchair or has trouble walking can actually get onto the bus. Okay. Thank you, Julia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next question says, how wide are the car travel lanes in alternative two? In all of the alternatives, the travel lanes are 11 feet wide. And again, that is because the New Jersey transit buses are 10 feet, six inches wide with mirrors. Okay, great. Next question says, regarding alternative three, since this provides a great road diet and a two-way bikeway with pretty good physical protection, where, why would we build anything else? Um, well, like I mentioned, um, the team agreed that um, bike lanes may not be an option um, on JFK Boulevard in this section. Um, and we would like to address the immediate need uh, for pedestrian safety. Um, some of the other considerations for the bike lane would be that it's gonna stop eventually. We have project limits, so there's really no place for the bike lane to, uh, I guess, continue at this point. Um, if anybody else would like to jump in, please feel free to do so. I don't know if you can hear me well, Julia. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in a little bit. I think, uh, okay. and, and Julia mentioned it that that while while the slide does show the the potential protection, there's a lot of issues in the corridor between driveways, hydrants, bus stops. Um, the the amount of protection we could provide would be limited, um, and especially the the issue being with the barriers, the Jersey barrier that's shown is. Um, there's a potential for a lot of blunt ends to cause even further concerns and the, the, uh, the protection would be intermittent and wouldn't be as effective as if you, you, you can't create a, a full, full blown protected bike lane. Um, there's a, be a lot of openings in it, which, which leads to further, further problems. So um, we do show the, the barrier as an example, but you really couldn't do it for the whole corridor. And uh, it, it was, I, I believe it was around a third of what yes. the corridor that we could protect, which really uh, in, in our conversations was not, not enough to provide a safe bike lane. Okay, thank you, Tom. The next question in the chat says, what would be the benefit of alternative four with only the northbound lane if alternative three has a two-way bike lane? Is there a commitment to build a southbound bike lane elsewhere? Um, so I mentioned that the um, Jersey City Bike Master Plan did have some parallel um, routes um, in their plan, but it, again, it's it's a plan. It's not anything um, that we can nail down at this point. Um, so the benefit of um, just the northbound lane is we, um, and this probably wasn't very clear, and I apologize. Um, with the two-way bike lane, we would actually have to um, eat into the sidewalk a little bit. Um, and you can call it widening of the roadway. Um, and we did not feel comfortable doing that um, given that the high pedestrian volume. 
So we felt the northbound only was a good compromise where we didn't have to eat into the sidewalk. Um, we could maintain more than six or eight feet wide sidewalks throughout the corridor um, and also provide at least one direction of bike lane. Okay, great. Next question says, is there any consideration for the Jitney buses? They pull over and stop traffic. Unfortunately, Jitney buses are very unpredictable, as I'm sure everybody on this call is aware. Um, because of the, I guess, lack of control over them, um, we really can't provide any bus stops for them. Um, even if we tried, there's a chance that they would not even use them and they would just go to a different location. Okay. And next question says, for the first option, were behind the curb cycle tracks investigated? I've seen examples in DC, Philly, Somerset, Massachusetts, and the Boston area. Um, we looked at in roadway bike lanes for this project. We did not investigate um, what did he call it or she curb cycle tracks behind no. i'm sorry behind the curb cycle tracks no we just looked at in roadway bike lanes okay next question says if there is no assurance from the city on a com complimentary one-way bike lane pair can we forget that idea and just do the two-way here I mean, like I said, it's it's not the preferred option um, at this okay. time. Okay. Sorry, I, I and I, per, I appreciate everyone's patience with me as I try to navigate through. There's so many comments in here, I can't read them all. So I'm just trying to get to all of the questions. Okay. Uh, next question says, do the proposed corridor delays shown, considering broader roadway network, differed deferred trips sorry other time and other routes and modal shifts let me try that one again do the proposed <laughs> cor sorry do the proposed corridor delays shown consider broader roadway network deferred trips other time and other routes and modal shifts um, so we pretty much just look at this corridor using the volume data that we have. That would be the worst case scenario um, for us to do an extensive roadway model of other roadways that are already at capacity. I think what we would find is not a whole lot of change. Um, <clears throat> so again, so whatever ship, um, whatever volumes are available to us that we project. We do look at um, developments, redevelopments, um, whether there's uh, other things that are going to come online in 2045. So those are accounted for. Hi, Julia. Yes. I think they meant, uh, did we look at, we look at the level of service for vehicles, but did we look at the level of service for pedestrians <clears throat> and bicycles? Uh, you can calculate level of service pedestrians is basically a density equation and you can also do level service for bicycles however the bicycles volumes were so low they were actually insignificant to do level service and density um, <clears throat> is basically for long walkways so once again the industry standard we did the level service for the vehicles i think that's what they meant by multimodal maybe wrong but i think that's what they meant Okay, thank you. And if not, they got additional information. Okay, we did have a question here about level of service, and I know you just mentioned it, so forgive me if I'm asking the same things. Hasn't level of service been thoroughly discredited as a measure for throughput versus the modern criteria for getting people through the corridor? Why are we citing LOS? I could answer that again, Julia, if you don't mind. Go for it. Just yeah. really loudly. 
I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry. The industry standard uh, for level service for vehicles is still the industry standard, uh, but and pedestrian uh, level service is also used. Uh, so there are different ways to measure levels of service, that's correct. But in our case, um, we were looking at the vehicular level of service um, at the intersections, which once again is the industry standard. And we took an account for pedestrians uh, by um, looking at the pedestrian times allotted to people to cross the roadways. Yeah, Bernie's audio is pretty awful. Uh, really, really hard to hear him tonight, but um, hopefully that helped. <laughs> and again, uh, the contact form is your best bet to ask questions and provide feedback. So we'll just keep getting through this chat box as we go along. And thank you all for your patience again. Uh, next question in the chat box says, do you only measure service for cars and not other street users? Um, well, like Bernie just said, we look at um, vehicles and we look at pedestrians. Um, and the way we look at the pedestrians is the um, crossing time. Okay. And for all these operational analyses, doesn't L level level of service, I'm sorry, level of service or LOS only focus on cars and assume no change in vehicular use when adding alternative means of travel? Um, again, it's it's based on the the volume data that we collect and we project and and we look at you know what's going to happen in 2045 based on the information we have available. Um, and this this would be the worst case. So if if people do decide to switch modes, uh, use the bus more, um, walk more, then obviously the level of service would improve. Okay. And this was following the level of service question. It says, is there a similar grading system for safety? Um, no, it's a little different. Uh, well, a lot different. <laughs> so okay. safety is um, determined based on a crash modification factor. Um, and they it just ends up telling you how much uh, crash reduction you receive. Um, it does not assign a letter grade, um, at least at this time. Okay, and was an intersection pedestrian level of service analysis conducted for the major intersections? Yes, those were the tables that were shown. Um, again, it's, it's, it's telling you the primarily the vehicular, but it also accounts for the pedestrians that are at the intersection. Okay. And um, again, I apologize if you've already answered these. What is the level of service for pedestrians? Why are all people, we are all people trying to get from point A to point B. Why is there a bias here for drivers? Um, there wouldn't be a bias per se, like Bernie said. This the industry. This is still the industry standard. Um, we primarily look at vehicles because that's the primary mode of transportation. Still, um, we do look at pedestrian volume um, and level of service again at the signalized intersections um, by accounting for them with pedestrian crossing times. Um, there are, and like Bernie said again, there are um, level of service metrics for pedestrians, but it's primarily along walkways. It's not at intersections at this time. Okay. How did the group arrive with PPA number one as the preferred? Um, like I said, we we went through all the pros and cons of each of the alternatives, um, and we determined that. Um, we need to move forward and address the immediate pedestrian and at intersection safety concerns. Um, and alternative number one meets that uh, criteria and also does not preclude, um, you know, bike lanes in the future once that all gets worked out. Okay, thank you. And why are the bike lane 
plans proposed as alternatives two, three, and four instead of alternative one, given the number of stakeholders who requested bike lanes during the 2020 meetings? It's just a number. There's no ranking associated with what's, it's not what's number one or what's number two. That's just the order that they went in when we set up the alternatives. There's really, really nothing to infer from that. Okay. Um, and I'm, again, I'm sorry if this is, th these questions I'm getting to in the chat are from 30 minutes ago. So we're still very That's behind okay. on questions. Uh, why are bike lanes not appropriate here? And I can only assume that means alternative, the, the, the PPA you're talking about. Sure. Um, so the bike lane alternatives two, three, and four, obviously two, we don't like at all because we can't protect it. Um, and three and four, we can only partially protect it um, about a third of the length. Um, and even then we can't protect it fully with barrier. And because we have all those breaks in between for fire hydrants and driveways and other um, roadway items that uh, need to be accessible for emergency services. Um, we would end up with a lot of uh, what we're calling blunt ends. And uh, when you have a blunt end, you need to protect it. So you need to, to put in some sort of, I'll call them crash cushions or attenuators or something on the ends of them to protect them. Um, and that is also not feasible with all the breaks in the um, in the protection. So we felt that since we can't fully protect the bike lane, um, it would be, uh, I'm not sure what the word would be. Um, I guess it wouldn't be appropriate for us to put one in. Okay. And regarding that same line of questioning, why go through all of this to add the bike lane later? Um, this is a safety improvement project. We obviously have a lot of crashes along the corridor that we would like to address. Um, we would certainly not want to delay addressing them any further. Um, part of concept development is going through alternatives and um, evaluating each of them, comparing them against each other, and ultimately selecting the one that, that um, we'll move forwards to address the purpose of the project, which is to address safety. So it's all part of the process. Okay. Next question says, will the county be maintaining the landscaping as they do our county parks? I'm gonna punt that one over to Tom and Jose. So I cannot speak for them. We, we you know, we have not had a conversation with the road department and parks department at this point yet so uh i don't have an answer but someone uh, will work it out someone will, will maintain them i just don't have okay. an answer to it yet that's okay thank you tom uh next question says what is the basis for using current bike data when the danger of the sh of the road keeps cyclists from biking the boulevard today Can you repeat that? What is the basis for using current bike data when the danger of the road keeps cyclists from biking the boulevard today? Okay, so then we would have to make some inferences on what we would think the um, bike activity would be if people felt safe. I think that's the question, right? Okay. And yeah, and, and again, uh, the, the best thing is for people, if we're not answering your questions adequately, uh, again, we're just trying to get through all of them because we have a very large meeting tonight. You can always send us questions via our emails. You can call Jose. And of, cor of course, as I mentioned, the contact form is always available. So I'll continue going through the chat box. And again, I, I appreciate everyone's patience as we try to navigate through all of these. Bernie, did you want to jump in on that one? 
Oh, now we can't hear you at all. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, the um, what you it was it's hard to uh, you know we try to predict uh, all the um, uh, modes of travel and their changes in volumes in the future. We actually use the North Jersey uh, regional traffic model, and that helps us because it uh, you know it adds in all the future development. And um, so the number one user in the in the area in the area is pedestrians with vehicles and so i think alternative that we the ppa that was chosen will actually uh decrease the number of pedestrians per area and um therefore increase improve the pedestrian level service and by far pedestrians what we counted was the highest uh, user so i mean it's hard for us to predict the future of bicyclists who's going to change the bicycles and who's going to use pedestrians Obviously, there'll be increasing bicycle issues, but pedestrians are the number one identified uh, non vehicular user in the area. So. I think okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was still, I'm sorry, I'm still reading the the chat box i'm trying to get through all of this there's so much in here uh there's lots of discussion about the bike lanes there's obviously lots of comments in here regarding everything with this uh people asking the opinions of others um lots of that going on and and uh everyone is saying yes yes we will you we will email the project team and use the comment form so that's great because that's exactly what we need is to have it on record so again that that uh website is on our project website jfk blvd project.com and you can just hit the contact form there okay moving right along uh, uh that was the next question where do we send in comments so uh that is your answer <laughs> All right, let's see what else we have here. Okay, next question says, are any sort of transit bus improvements being included, such as transit signal priority or TSP? Well, we did not include it in these alternatives. Um, if that's something that New Jersey Transit would like, we would have a conversation with them in the next phase, um, but that really has to come from them wanting have the, the transit bus priority. Okay. Far they Next. haven't mentioned it. Okay. Next question says, what do we have to do to make JFK safer for all users, including cyclists, and all non-motorized users, including those who work on bicycles? I'm not really sure if that's a real question or more of a comment. Okay. If if you would like to, please do send that message to the project team and we can investigate that and see if we have a, a, a more specific answer for you. The next question says, uh, let's see. If alternative three checks all of the safety and accessibility boxes, how do you come to dismiss it in favor of alternative one? Like I mentioned, um, it's all with the protection. We can't protect the bike lane for the entire length. We can only do about a third of it and we're gonna have gaps in between. Um, and we did not feel comfortable having a essentially a partially protected bike lane at this time. And Julia, if I can add to that, it was, uh, we were working with the city and the city uh, stated that um, they wanted positive protection, you know, barrier protection. Um, and because of the high ADT of the roadway, the, the large number of vehicles on the roadway. So they had to actually input into why, to the type of, uh, of uh, cycling facilities they wanted. 
and we just couldn't meet those goals, like you said. It would, the protection barrier, the barriers would have to been separated. We would have, Tom mentioned, less than a third of the area would be covered. So. Okay. Uh, the next question says, the bike lanes that have already been created on Bergen Avenue, did it reduce any traffic related issues or accidents? I cannot answer that question because we did not analyze Bergen Avenue. Um, I don't know if there's anybody on the call that has that information either. Okay. Elias Gooseman might have it. Okay, thank you. Um, Is there any consideration for dedicated bike, I'm sorry, dedicated bus lanes for bus rapid transit at any point along JFK Boulevard? No, there's really no room to accommodate that um, in addition to uh, needing to maintain the two lanes and, and providing for some of the other elements. Okay. I've got a question here for Tom. Is the is the county taking into account the number of planned construction sites within the next two years on JFK? Uh, yes, all of, all of the approved developments along the corridor that have come before the planning board uh, were provided to the consultant and, and their projections do include um, the growth of, of, the, uh, of the corridor. Yeah, we, we included them in our analysis, all, all the new plan development. Okay, I'm still about 30 minutes behind in uh, the chat box here, looking at questions that were entered in uh, about a half hour ago, still trying to sort through all of this. One of the questions here says, why is an alternative three the PPA? Have you not heard from people asking for bike protection? <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, we <laughs> Alternative three is not the PPA because we cannot provide full protection along the bike lane and we're gonna have gaps. We can only provide about a third of it due to driveways, fire hydrants, um, other roadside features that need to be accessible. Um, if we also provide um, full protection, again, we would have to take into consideration, which um, was mentioned earlier, um, how people are going to get onto the bus because the buses will not encroach or could not encroach onto the bike lane if it was protected. Okay. Uh, again, uh, all of these many, many questions regarding the bike lanes. So I'm sure you've already asked, answered many of them. I'm going to do my best to try to not skip too many. Um, one of the questions in the chat, though, does say that are these four alternative designs available to view again, and are they available online? And tomorrow we will publish this video along with any additional documentation from the project team, as I believe we mentioned. So this information will be available tomorrow on the project website. Uh, one of the questions is regarding the team and who approved the designs and uh, the PPA and things like that. You know, who is making this decision for the PPA? Can can someone elaborate on that? Sure. The project team, the team consists of the, the county county engineer's office, the consultant, uh, and the uh, NJTPA, and we take input from the public officials stakeholders and the public uh, to to make the determinations we've made so those are those are the team members that uh, have been working on this project for 
well over a year now, two years. Yep. Thanks, Tom. Next question says, can you share which intersections are currently planned to have curb extensions? I think it would make sense to add these in for all of the intersections. Could we also have raised crosswalks? Um, okay, so let me go back to the, um, does somebody want to answer the raised crosswalks while I look for the list? Yeah, yeah I, I, I can address Please. that. Or, or, or Chris, you want to address that? Oh, you go ahead, Tom. Um, we, we, we understand that, um, you know, the, the Department of Transportation does not allow raised crosswalks and raised intersections on roads with over 3,000 vehicles per day. So they are not included in this project. I, I will I will tell you that uh, there um, is going to uh, the county may be considering uh, asking the Department of Transportation to uh, allow deviation from that. Uh, I don't know where that will go. Uh, that's at a very uh, that'll be at a very high level. Um, but uh, currently they're not they're not permitted on a road with this much traffic. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so the curb extensions at Pavonia Avenue will be um, in the in the two corners of Pavonia Avenue and then across the street along JFK Boulevard southbound. There's a little bit of a bump out there. Um, we couldn't do too much more because of the driveways to um, some of the office buildings there. And then um, at Van Ripen Avenue, we're eliminating that third outside lane. So that entire area will be um, extended out in sidewalk. And then on the opposite side, we're also proposing a curb extension along JFK Boulevard southbound. Um, on, at Cottage Street, we just have the center uh, pedestrian refuge island. Um, there will be a slight curb extension done by, by a developer, but it will only be on Cottage Street. Um, we have the curb extension at Newark um, on, the, on the south side of Newark uh, by eliminating the um, channelized right turn lane and then across the street on the southbound direction. Um, Van Winkle, we have them in along the southbound direction again on, on both sides of Van Winkle. Um, there was not enough room on the northbound direction to put in any curb extensions. And then at um, St. Paul's, we're just pulling out the sidewalk um, in the northwest corner um, by removing the right turn lane. Uh, there's no additional curb extensions at that intersection. Okay, thank you. Next question says, the analysis presented concluded that reallocating space for non-vehicular modes negatively impacts vehicles. Shouldn't there be a higher level conversation like the one that was had in the development of the bicycle master plan to consider the broader vision in creating mobility options, especially in connection with regional transit? Um, I would say, yes, there needs to be a broader, more regional assessment of, of everything like that. This project is only focused on a small section of JFK Boulevard, again, from Pavonia to just a little bit north of St. Paul. So we do not have the opportunity in this project to look at um, a regional bike plan or um, mobility plan. Um, that's not the intent of this project. The intent of this project is to improve safety along JFK Boulevard between Pavonia and St. Paul Avenues. Okay, great. Are the goals and priorities of this project available? Um, the I believe this is probably referring to the purpose and need. Purpose and need statement. Um, so it's it's really just what I presented. There's nothing really to make available. I'm just checking the website really quickly. Um, yes, yes. The purpose and need statement is, is available on the right? website. Yep. That's what I. Think. Okay. I'm uh, I'm it's I'm gonna copy the link and put it into the chat box. Okay. Yeah, um, other than that, there's, that, that's it. Okay, uh, next question. 
what is the effect of the presence of cyclists on a street of on I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I'm reading this correctly. What is the effect of the presence of cyclists on a street on pedestrian safety? What can you tell us about research showing that PBLs enhance pedestrian driver and overall safety? PBL is protected bike lane, I assume. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any particular uh, research or studies to point to right now. Um, on the effects of that. I don't know if anybody else is aware of anything. All right, let's 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 keep moving. Have considerations been made to the vastly increasing density of this area and JSQ for being a major transit hub for many people in the surrounding community? Yes, all all redevelopment, all projections, anything that's going on at Journal Square, that's all accounted for in the analysis. Okay, great. And there was a couple other additional questions here about the project team and you know voting and things like that. So I do want to point out that again the project team information is also on the website there's a page for that it just gives you the um, the different staff members that are part of this study um, and uh, and it's all available on the website Have have there uh, has there been any pedestrian studies done as in regard to how many people actually walk JFK? Um, well, we when we did our count program, we counted all the pedestrians that um, walked along JFK and, and crossed at the intersections. Um, as as far as a more global or longer. Um, pedestrian study. Um, we didn't do one as part of this project. I don't know if the county has um, any studies ongoing. No, we, we currently don't have any, any additional pedestrian studies going on in the, for Journal Square. Okay, and have you considered the impact a wider sidewalk without bike lanes will have on the safety of cyclists going to and from Journal Square? Um, they would go to Journal Square the same way that they do today. Okay. Can you discuss the... Yeah. Uh, you know, once again, um, you know, the pedestrians were the highest number of uh, users in the area. So the widening of the sidewalk was to in improve the level of service for pedestrians. Uh, bicyclists were a much lower number, and I understand that more bicyclists will come if you provide a bike lane. But we went with the data that we had, and the data that we had had uh, pedestrians significantly higher, much higher. And literally in the thousands compared to uh, bicyclists were at each intersection, maybe highest numbers were 20 or 30. So. And I've got a specific follow up just for you, Bernie. It says here, Bernie, can you explain on the level of service being low for bicyclists? Is this based on existing bicycle traffic? And which proposal does this look at for bicycle level of service? Well, like I said, you know, we didn't, we don't have a bicycle LOS. Uh, there, there are different ways to measure level of service for different modes of traffic. Um, once again, we look at the industry standard, uh, which is uh, the LOS that is done by the Highway Capacity Manual for vehicular traffic. We also know for pedestrian traffic that, you know, that's just basically based on density, right? The number of pedestrians. For a certain area, um, so those two uh, are 
are the main drivers because those are the two main users in the area. Uh, bicycle traffic, um, I believe, uh, we don't we didn't run a LOS on that, and once again, that was the numbers were were rather small. The existing numbers were rather small. Hopefully, that answers the question. I'm not sure if it did or not. Uh, if I could just jump in for a second, just to clarify, um, that, that was my question. Uh, we're not. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, no, we're not allowing anyone to mute, uh, unmute right now. We're just trying to stick to the chat box because we don't want to get off uh, onto another topic. I, I do apologize. We only have another 40 minutes and I've still got uh, a plethora of uh, questions to, to get through. So if we could just please try to stick to the format, I'd really appreciate it here. Um, the next question here says, to what extent has the staffed work the staff worked with the Jersey City, um, work with Jersey City to compare potential bike routes, namely on JFK, Summit, and or Baldwin Avenue. Jersey City has been involved in this concept development, um, you know, from the beginning. Um, so we've been working with them for quite some time now. Um, I okay. can't speak to their own routes which are Summit and Baldwin, um, and we're, we're still having discussions about that. Okay, and next question says, are you aware the federal goals to improve safety for pedestrians and cyclists, scooters, etc.? If you go with alternative one, we then need to waste taxpayer money to dig this up and use new federal money to build the bike lane later? Yes, we are aware of uh, all the federal safety um, rules, if you want to call them that. Um, you know, we maybe we don't um, dig it up per se. Maybe we just convert it, and it's a raised bike lane, which I think was somebody else's comment. Um, but that's that's something that can be accommodated in the future, regardless. Mm-hmm. Okay, next question says, on the northbound lanes, there's a left turn signal into a parking deck. It's used 95% of the time as an illegal U-turn, which is very dangerous. Is that being eliminated? No, that is going to remain. Okay. Uh, same question came in again, uh, maybe 10 minutes later about the alternatives being able to to find them on the project website. They will be available hopefully by tomorrow. So once again, all of the slides, the presentation itself, any additional information we can post to the project website, it will be available tomorrow. All right, next question. Um, What are the cons for alternatives two, three, and four? I'm having trouble seeing how providing safe bicycle facilities of any sort is not preferable. So the cons are that for the bike lanes two, we don't have really enough room to protect the bike lane at all, especially in the southbound direction. And three and four, we can only partially protect the bicycle lane. Okay. Um, and and again, just going back, maybe you can bring these slides back up, Julia. Um, it says, can you show the versions two versus versus th alternatives two versus three once again? Hey, Julia, we only see the uh, end slide. Oh, there we go. Yep, I know. I paused it, so you don't have to. <laughs> look through me fanning through slides. Um, so here's alternative two. This is the bike lane in each direction. Um, we can only provide a buffer through part of it. We can't protect it at all in the northbound direction and in the southbound direction. We do not have room for, for much um, buffer, much less protection. And alternative three, the two-way protected bike lane um, where feasible. 
as you can see, we have um, some Jersey barrier um, where we can't provide Jersey barrier. We have the raised curb with delineators um, and there's instances, as you can see, there's gaps um, in the image where we can't provide any protection at all because there's something that needs to be accessed at that location along the curbside. Okay, thanks. Um, next question here says, and again, forgive me if you've already answered this, if Jersey barriers are hard to put in, have you looked at raised curbs or raised bike lanes and other bike lane protections used throughout many cities in, and uh, other areas throughout the US? Um, so where we couldn't provide the Jersey barrier, we did the raised curb with the delineators. Um, and of course, like I said, it's not um, able to be put in in all locations throughout the entire length. Um, in terms of raised bicycle um, lanes, uh, all the stuff that we looked at was in roadway bicycle lanes. Okay, great. The next question here says, can you please elaborate on how your recommended PPA aligns with the county's complete streets resolution? Sorry, I'm just gonna pull up the, the PPA real quick. Um, I don't have the resolution memorized or in front of me at the moment, um, but I'm, based on the one that is uh, NJDOT's, um, it does meet some of their criteria that is in the complete streets policy. I don't know if um, someone from the county or anyone else would like to elaborate. Yeah, I, I believe, and I don't have it in front of me, I happened to review it a couple of days ago, but it, it, it does say we, we will look at accommodating all users and to the extent practicable, we will accommodate everyone that we can and that was the purpose of this local concept development was to look at all the alternatives and and look at the major road users which were the pedestrians and the vehicles and accommodate those that we could to the extent we can and i think julie has articulated uh the reasons why uh the protected bike lane was not feasible because of the the lack of ability to uh protect those um those bikers. So uh, I think to the extent we can, we, we meet the uh, tenants in our complete streets policy. Thanks, Tom. Okay. I'm still chopping through the chat box here. Again, uh, lots of people asking about the, the drawings and the alternatives. And again, I, I We'll reiterate those will be available tomorrow on our project website. So I appreciate uh, everybody's interest in having them. And I'm also sorting through all of the comments, trying to find the question. So again, I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, one of the questions that was asked here is, what is the point of having this meeting if the PPA has already been determined? Um, so this is just what we're recommending as the PPA. It's not fully determined or finalized until we receive all public comment and we go to the interagency review committee. That's why I, I, I'm, if I didn't say it, um, it's a recommended preferred alternative. It's not the final. Uh, another I, I to build just to build on what Julia said that that's the that is the point of this meeting that is the point of the public meeting we've had uh, a number of public officials meetings we've had a number of stakeholders meetings we've already had one public information center so actually this is this is where the recommended PPA is rolled out um, for everyone and, and obviously we still we're taking comments tonight we'll take them for the next uh, until March 18th. Um, so yeah, that's that's the purpose of, of this meeting is is to roll it out so everybody can uh, see it and comment on it. 
Thanks, Tom. And next question here says, why doesn't DOT permit raised crosswalks on over 3,000 vehicles without factoring in the amount of pedestrian traffic on those intersections? Um, I'm not sure what their rationale behind um, the 3,000 vehicles is, to be perfectly honest. I'm sure it has a valid reason. I just don't know what it is. Okay. And the next question says, can you please explain why you are maintaining the southbound dedicated right turn lane at Newark Avenue? Um, so there's a couple reasons. Um, there's, I believe, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, there's, there's a large number of right turning vehicles. And there's also a bus stop at that location. That's correct, Julia. We have a we have a it's not a crazy amount of right turning vehicles, but we do have a, a significant right turning volume, and uh, there is a bus stop at that location. So um, the the bus stop will be able to use that that uh, wider pavement area. Thank you. Okay, next question says, the lane in front of the Stanley Theater is used for a drop-off location for both the theater and for JSQ. Is there a planned drop-off point for the PATH station? Um, the PATH station is not within our project limits. Um, and so, no, and, and we're, um, you know, most of the drop off loading locations goes through the planning board. So that's not something that um, is included in this project. Okay. Uh, next question here says, do you have any statistics on the amount of traffic between Pavonia and St. Paul's, perhaps an average or an hourly basis? Um, yes, we do. I don't have it right in front of me at the moment. I have the, Julie, I have the flow diagram up okay. and uh, typically flowing through the corridor, you have about a thousand vehicles in each direction during the peak hour. Okay. And I think there's a couple hundred pedestrians as well, right? Yeah, you have, uh, you know, just for instance, uh, along JFK Boulevard crossing Pavonia Avenue in the northbound direction, you have about 758 pedestrians in that crosswalk in the AM peak hour. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. And I'm much closer to the end of the chat box here. I'm still about 15 minutes out from when these questions were asked. So again, I appreciate everyone's patience and we will get to the callers who have called in as well, who are unable to ask their questions in the chat. Next question says, were bus ridership numbers looked at when deciding not to have a bus lane? How are the numbers of bus users weighed against other modes? Um, we don't have bus ridership information from New Jersey Transit. We can certainly make some inferences from the number of buses that go through the corridor and and because we know the number of seats. But to expand on that, one of the questions before was also to have a separate bus lane. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that would be something that, you know, our project is, is the limits are only from Pavonia to St. Paul's. Uh, to really do that, you would have to have more of a regional study. So that's why we didn't really look at uh, bus lane. And also, like you said, we didn't count all the people in the buses themselves, which is typically anywhere from 35 to 40 in a full bus. But, and while you're on, Bernie, I actually have another one here for you. It says, to clarify my question from earlier, Bernie stated that the level of service for bicyclists in the proposal was insignificant. What factors contributed to that being labeled as insignificant? Well, I'm sorry if I said insignificant. Um, there is a what they call a BLOS, uh, Bicycle Level Safe, uh, Service Analysis. Uh, and that actually takes into account uh, bicycle volumes, uh, average ADT for the roadway, roadway width, um, you know, and uh, PHF, which is peak hour factor. When you actually do a BLOS with the volumes that are there now, um, you show 
high level, a good levels of service for the bicyclists. Um, and the point has been made that if you build the bicycle track or the bicycle path or whatever you've chosen, that more bicyclists will come, but we really don't have that number. So to predict how many bicyclists will come and then enter that into a BLOS, um, we just don't have that information. If somebody has uh, bicycle prediction numbers, I don't know if the county has, you know, we could do an analysis. We don't have that information right now. All right, thanks, Bernie. And uh, a, a lot of people are asking the same question, so I will address this one. Um, we can only, the, the quote was made, we can only partially protect. That shouldn't be a reason to throw out the alternative. Um, why do you believe that partial protection is worse than no protection? Please ask the engineer to explain. Um, I would I would think that um, based on some of the feedback we've gotten on this project and other projects, um, you want a protected bike lane. Um, so obviously a unprotected bike lane would not be um, really an option for this corridor um, and only protecting a third of it is essentially having an unprotected bike lane. Okay, thank you for explaining that. Uh, someone asked a question here to confirm, you will be ensuring a commitment to a protected bike lane and it will be delivered in final design? I did not say that. Okay. Uh, someone asked if the chat comments will be available on the website, and the answer is no. Okay, next question. Can the representative from the county please explain your concern about driveways and fire hydrants? In, in terms of not providing protection for them? Well, well, driveways, you know, businesses along the corridor have driveways for loading and access uh, and need those to be maintained, uh, hydrants, fire department needs access to it, bus stops, the, the bus riders need access to the bus stop. So uh, those are the reasons that we can't provide the protection in, in front of those. Um, we're not in a position to make a, a, a blanket statement that we're now gonna restrict access to everyone along the corridor and shut down people's businesses. That's not, the, that's not our goal. So those are the concerns as to why we can't put barriers in front in front of uh, those entities. Thanks, Tom. Can I can uh, I clarify my question? That was that was just my question. Um, sorry, we're not allowing anyone to unmute at this time because we are so limited on 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 time. But again, the best way to reach the project team is via email or the contact form, so we can discuss this further offline. Because we do only have about 20 minutes left, and I do want to make sure I get to some of the callers as well. So I do apologize. Next question says, will there be another public meeting after the PPA has been voted on? Not in concept development. The There is a PPA. Um, PPA. There is a public meeting that will be held in preliminary engineering. So this is mm -hmm. the last one for this phase. And those four phases of the project are also available on the website for anyone who hasn't visited yet. So you can see the different phases of this project and how it goes along. Uh, question here, who are the members of the interagency review committee? Um, that's generally representatives from the DOT and FHWA. Um, don't know, uh, NJTPA maybe. Um, is there anyone else, Bernie? Yeah, NJTPA, FHWA, uh, DOT, and the county. Thank you. And a uh, good question was asked here. Does the recommended PPA ever get changed based on public feedback? 
sometimes. Okay. Um, sorry, next question says here, if you don't have the bus ridership numbers from NJ Transit, can you request them and factor them into this analysis? Um, I'm not sure if that's really going to make much of a difference because we already have the counts for the actual buses. I don't know, Bernie, did you want to elaborate? Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. You know, we look, if you're doing a vehicle level service, that's correct. If we were doing, uh, we have performed a bus transit signal priority system in Manhattan. So if, when you're doing a transit signal priority system, uh, you would, you again, you would look at the number of uh, riders in the bus, right? Because mm -hmm. obviously a bus would have a heavier weight than a vehicle. Right. Uh, once again, that that's is more of a regional study and something we we're looking more at a very small segment of Kennedy Boulevard. Okay. I'm, just, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm still reading. I'm just about done. And then we're going to go to a couple of callers here. When you factored in buses, did you weigh one bus as one car in your analysis? Or did you consider that a bus may have 60 people inside? Um, it's just a count of, of the physical vehicle. It doesn't account for the number of people in the vehicle. What factors are going into the length of time you give for crossing the street by pedestrians? Um, so we look at the length of the crosswalk. We look at the um, speed of the pedestrians. Um, and we look at other elements, like if there's a lot of school children or a lot of seniors, then the, um, the crossing rate um, would be lowered and that would increase the available time to cross the intersection. Um, someone asked the question here about uh, who the public officials are opposing the bike lanes so that they can consult them or contact them. Is that something that? I don't know who they are. I'm not sure. Tom, anything? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What was the question I was reading? I was trying to read through the chats. Uh, you and me both. <laughs> Can you tell us who are the publicly elected officials opposing the bike lanes so that we can contact them as constituents? I don't know that I have a list of those that, that are opposed to it. I think uh, everyone is free to, to reach out for all their elected officials and ask the question, uh, but I don't, I don't have a specific list. Okay. Yeah, we we don't keep tallies on who likes and who doesn't like something. Uh, another comment and question here was regarding um, online meetings and it uh, leaving out people who have language barriers or no access to the internet. And um, we do want to point out that in our work that we are always trying to be inclusive of everyone. So whenever we find the need for in-person events or translation services or translating materials into other languages, we certainly try to do that. In, in regard to the internet, um, it was also uh, noted that if anyone did not have access to the internet, that project materials would be mailed to them. So mm -hmm. just wanted to point that out. And I think we've done that in the past. Yep. 
Okay. Okay, I do believe I'm at the end of the chat box. So uh, again, I, I wanna thank everyone for your patience. Uh, I did my best to try to get through all of the questions. I know we saw a lot of repeats. There's a lot of comments in the chat box. So I do wanna ask uh, and, and give the opportunity for the few people who have called in to, to ask their question to the project team. Again, uh, we're looking for um, short and sweet comments and que uh, questions rather, if possible, just for the sake of time. So I'm gonna see if I have any, um, any callers still on. I know there were some on earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not seeing anyone now. Okay, I apologize. All right, let's continue on here. Um, someone here says that all of the comments should be on the website and maybe somebody from NJTPA or the county can comment on why we don't publish the chat box questions to the website. And someone did say in the chat box, chat is not public, email them to go on record. And yes, that is uh, what we've said before. And in order for it to be considered an official comment, it must be received one, via one of those three ways. I don't know if I'd want to chat with my name on it, um, published for anybody to look up and potentially cause harm. Yep. Okay, uh, one more question here says, why is no protection a superior alternative to limited protection? Can you explain that? Um, I don't believe that I called one versus the other superior. Um, obviously, we would want to protect a bike lane and one of the alternatives didn't have any protection, so we are, wouldn't even probably move that one much further than where it is now, which is just a concept. Um, partially protected again, um, because we only have about a third that we can protect. It's almost as if you have an unprotected bike. Okay, we are um, almost fully caught up here. Uh, another comment or question says, do you, do you not consider that if there are no bike lanes, then bikers would go on sidewalks and endanger, endanger pedestrian safety? Um, that's always a possibility that a bicyclist will use the sidewalk instead of the roadway. Um, and it may be considered, uh, you know, an annoyance or, or maybe pedestrians don't feel comfortable with it, but um, certainly um, being hit by a bicycle is a lot less painful than being hit by a car.
Okay, so at this point, we're gonna ask again for uh, additional questions for the project team. We do have about 10 minutes left and would like to certainly utilize the last 10 minutes of the meeting for additional comments, uh, or sorry, questions specifically that we can address during this time. Again, we want to reiterate that all official comments must be made in one of the ways that are on your screen right now by contacting Jose Sierra via email, sending us a formal comment through the project website, or you can mail or email it to me. I am the community involvement facilitator, and I will pass along all of your uh, comments to our project team for the study. Has the Port Authority weighed in on how the proposed alternative would enable people to get to and from Journal Square and the PATH? Um, we have not gotten any input from the Port Authority um, at this time. Um, okay. I don't see any um, issues with getting to and from Journal Square. Um, something was said about a turn lane being used as a bus stop. Did I hear that right? I believe NJT doesn't like this because drivers make dangerous turns around the bus. Um, that I think that was the right turn lane at Newark. Yes, the, the right turn lane at Newark. Uh, so it basically actually today is, a, is there's three southbound lanes um the continuous from uh, I think, uh van winkle down uh past pavonia um and that what we're doing is we're turning that that you know the end of that right that s southbound third lane into a right turn lane um and the remainder of that lane you know in approach of the intersection can be used by the bus uh to stop so a bus stop won't be in directly the uh the right turn lane but it the pavement width will be there for the bus stop. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Another question and comment. Are you aware of the climate crisis that is affecting Hudson County? Are you aware that the transportation sector is responsible for 40% of New Jersey emissions? Yes. I, I think once again, you know, our project limits are are from basically Pavonia, St. Paul, it's just a little bit north. Um, and what we're trying to do is not to be in the in our PPA or the recommended PPA is not improving vehicular traffic. Actually, it's lowering the level of service for vehicular traffic. We're actually increasing the level of service for pedestrians. Um, we are not opposed to bike lanes, um, and the PPA does not preclude future bike lanes, uh, but we want to move this project forward so that we can enhance safety for pedestrians. We're trying to do the, the best we can with, within the constraints that we have. Uh, we didn't actually consider climate change <clears throat> when we did our calculations. Um, I don't think it would be a significant part of climate change or impact on the same. Uh, once again, you got to look at the limits of the project. Next question in the chat box says, when do you plan to begin construction? Can you talk a little bit about the four phases and how it takes to get to progress for each one? <coughs> yes, I can. <laughs> when I stop coughing. I'm just going to go back to the slide because that's a little bit easier. Give me one moment. Of course, it's all the way in the beginning. Okay, there we go. Yes, it is. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, right, so the four um, phases. So once we are finished with uh, local concept development, the uh, the project will likely go out to solicitation for engineering firms to complete local preliminary engineering and final design. Um, 
depending on the project size and what's being proposed. Um, local preliminary engineering can take about a year, sometimes a little longer, it's plus or minus. Um, once the environmental document is executed, then you can move into final design. Um, and that's where you prepare your construction documents. Um, if there's right away, uh, the final design phase um, usually takes a little bit longer. And by right away, I mean if, if there's any um, acquisitions that need to be um, acquired prior to going into construction, whether it's a temporary easement just for construction or it's an actual um, fee take of, of somebody's, uh, a portion of somebody's property, let's say. Um, so final design can run from anywhere from one to two years. Um, and then once that is completed, the project goes out to bid for contractors. Um, and then once the bid is awarded to a contractor, it um, goes to construction. So you're probably looking at uh, 2026 at this point. Did I do the math right? 2025, 2026. Great, thank you. And this information on the project delivery process is also available on our website if you need to see it again. All right, last uh, couple of questions here and comments before we wrap up. It says here, last meeting that we had, the fence down the middle was contentious. I haven't heard a mention of it tonight. What is the rationale for it? It seems hostile for pedestrians. How wide is the median? Could it be narrower, narrower to free up space for other useful things along the curbs? Um, there's not a whole lot to gain from um, reducing the median width. It's um, not as wide as a lane, let's say. It's not 11 feet wide all, um, throughout the entire lane. Um, <clears throat> we want pedestrians to um, cross at the signalized intersections. Um, we heard from stakeholders um, from the last meeting that um, indicated that people are crossing at Van Winkle, I'm sorry, Van Ripen, um, which is currently um, not signalized and there's no crosswalks. Um, so we want to, um, so that's one of the reasons why we put in um, the signalized pedestrian crossing. We want people to cross where um, they can see vehicles and vehicles will stop for them and then uh, vehicles will see them um, and know that or anticipate that they will be there. Um, so uh, we don't want pedestrians uh, necessarily just crossing wherever they would like to cross. Um, it's not safe for them. It's not, you know, not safe for the, the vehicles um, or the drivers, I should say. Um, so the, that's the purpose of the fence. It will likely be a, a decorative fence and the landscaping will um, add to uh, soften the, any effects of, of the fence itself. And to add on to that question, another one came in that said, um, was there ever an alternative with no median? No. Okay. And what will the speed limit be for cars in this section? Um, the speed limit will remain at 25 miles an hour. How will this project be funded? Um, that is a great question that I will have to pass on to somebody from NJTPA if they're still available. Uh, Patty, are you there? Uh, yes, so far the camera turned on. There we are. Um, the Goal is for us to use federal safety funds um, through um, the Federal Highway Administration in order to fund this project, which is our goal is uh, towards pedestrian safety and the, the crosswalks, um, improvements to the signals, and everything should add up to enough points for us to um, get funding from Federal Highway. Okay, great. Thank you, Patty. And last question here says, are there plans to put in crosswalks at every corner in the project area and signals as well? 
Um, well, for each intersection, I believe the only intersection that was unsignalized was Van Rypen, and we put in a uh, pedestrian crossing that is signalized. So um, every crossing will be signalized. Um, okay. We're not in proposing any mid blocks elsewhere. Great. Okay. All right. I am going to one last time put into the chat box right now the contact form for everyone and we'll put up the last slide uh, as our closing slide for everyone who uh, needs to see it one last time and again this recording will be available tomorrow on the website along with some additional project information so once again the the contact form is the way to officially submit all of your comments and feedback regarding this presentation tonight and regarding the project, the comment period will remain open through March 18th. So again, on your screen, you should see Jose's name and phone number, as well as his email address. We have the contact form on our website. And of course, my information is there as well if you need to utilize mail to mail in your comments. So with that said, I want to thank everybody for your patience tonight with our meeting. We know we had a very large turnout, which was great, and encourage everyone to continue putting in their comments regarding the study through our project website. On behalf of the project team, I want to thank everybody for your time tonight and thank you for your participation. And with that, we will close out our meeting formally. So have a great night and thanks again. Goodbye, everyone.